Hello, and welcome to another episode of Healthy Minds. I'm Julie, your host. This episode is part of our series called Black Mental Health Matters. We're covering different aspects of systemic racism and their impact on mental wellness. I have a special guest joining me today. Uh, her name is Kimberly Humphrey, and she is a federal and state legislative affairs expert with over a decade of experience. She's an attorney by trade and activist at heart, committed to unlocking opportunity in workplaces and public policy spaces. She works with government and organizational leaders to ensure that policies have a positive practical impact on every person. Her commitment to representation and elevating marginalized voices, especially those of historically underserved Black Americans, has opened doors to deeper community influence and lasting systemic change. Great. <laughs> um, her work experience ranges from human resources policy development to civil rights advocacy. In 2017, she served on the Maryland Commission on the School to Prison Pipeline and Restorative Practices, an advisory body that studied the impact of police in schools and recommended culture-defining changes for school leaders and law enforcement. She also advocated for and won a distinct racial equity review of Maryland's long-awaited public education funding formula recommendations. Kimberly is a sought-after strategist who has presented at numerous conferences, panels, legislative briefings, including before the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and now she's joining us on this humble podcast to talk a little bit about racism and representation in the workplace. So hi and welcome. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited, especially about the restorative practices piece. Um, I actually did some work very closely with restorative practices um, model in Howard County with the Homewood School. Wonderful. Yeah, so it's kind of cool to see you out there in the, <laughs> in the wild, so to speak, and then bring it right back in. It's funny how connected we all are. So we're talking about racism and representation in the workplace today, and I'm really curious to hear what you think maybe is the most glaring example of racism in the workplace. Sure. Um, I think that first, when we talk about racism um, and mental health, I just think it's important to clarify what racism is. Um, oftentimes in our common lexicon, uh, racism is kind of misunderstood. A lot of people tend to think of racism as uh, an interpersonal hate, right? Um, but it's important to understand that racism is a system, right? So it's defined as a system of advantage and oppression that is based on race. Um, and I really thought it was important to, um, you know, just clarify that because when we think about that, it helps us understand the, the layers of racism in our society. Of course, um, the workplace being one of them and the place where I find that is often most glaring. Um, but um, it takes it out of just that interpersonal, you know, I'm not racist, I didn't harm you. Uh, so what are all the complaints and the discussion that are still happening for something that happened, you know, centuries ago? Um, so I hope that's helpful for everyone. And it, it, I think it's just important to couch my comments in that. And um, I think the example that I want to talk about, which is pay equity, uh, really highlights some of those issues, too. So uh, for, I think maybe the easiest way to explain the pay equity issue is the disparity that we see uh, based on research. And, um, you know, I think the latest movement of Time's Up, the um, movement that happened in Hollywood really highlights the issues that we see with pay equity or pay inequity. Um, so it's when people basically do not get the same pay for equal work. Um, and unfortunately, we see that this happens along the lines of race, um, but, you know, gender, uh, disability, a lot of other categories. And um, it's just essentially seems to be based on normed practices of oppression um, or, or advantage for one over another, because it's often just based on, you know, the history of what we've defined as more valuable. Uh, which insights whose work is more valuable. And so traditionally, uh, just to give context, you know, white males, um, kind of at the top of the totem pole in our society, again, um, the system that gives advantages for one over another. 
And so as other folks entered the workforce um, and where you have decision makers that, you know, don't always represent everyone, um, the data shows that unfortunately there are a lot of pay inequities and pay gaps. And uh, so I, that's one I feel very passionately about. And I hope that, you know, in addition to the uh, climate and the change that we're seeing along the lines of police brutality, that we will also begin to have more conversations about the everyday ways uh, that racism really impacts um, people across society. Yeah, um, thank you so much for giving us the context and um, explaining kind of what we mean by racism, not just the overt, um, I don't like you <laughs> side of things, which of course is very real and, and happens all the time, but there's a lot more of the, I'm gonna say sneakier things or the covert um, side of racism. Uh, and it's important to acknowledge that our systems are built to benefit the, the white male um, typically. And the further away you get from being a white male, able-bodied, cisgendered, <laughs> heterosexual person, the more likely you are to experience multiple types of oppression or racism or sexism or whatever ism we're talking about at the moment. Um, and of course you can be subject to multiple of these. Yeah, intersectionality, um, I believe that's the term, really I think gained a lot of popularity um, around the time of the Women's March mm -hmm. uh, where we were just having more conversations about again, race, you know, um, a lot of women generally uh, had concerns about, you know, time's up. Um, our, our president, Donald Trump, and his um, unfortunate history um, of abuse of women. Um, but we also, you know, began to have these conversations about inter intersectionality because we saw Black women wanting to to make sure that their voices were also heard and making sure that the, um, that the movement, you know, was recognizing and really lifting up and trying to change the different ways that um, oppression is experienced. Yeah, um, and I know I've seen intersectionality pop up all over my Facebook and Instagram again, which is great, but it also makes me laugh to see like what, what's trending um, and, you know, terms and all that stuff kind of popping up. You're like, oh, okay, is this what we're talking about now? Cool. Um, you know, I have some thoughts on this and I'm going to learn more, obviously, as well. I don't know if you have this. I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have an example or some of the numbers maybe in the um, equity disparity? In equity? Yes, I do. Uh, so recently, the Economic uh, Policy Institute, I want to get the name right, um, they did a study, um, basically it was an analysis of the census data that was released. Um, and it showed that from 2000 and 2017, um, wages have been stagnant across the board, right? But in that time, um, men's wages have actually increased, I believe. I don't, let me make sure I get this right by 1.1% and women's, um, women's wages have increased by 7%, which is good news. So the, the wage gap is narrowing, but when you look at race, you see that the gaps trending through the years are pretty much the same. So that means that um, black people and black women especially have not seen that that narrowing. Um, and so, you know, it's an ongoing conversation. It's an ongoing issue that needs to be addressed. But even when we talk about the wage gap, um, comparing everyone to white males, um, I found it very interesting that, and it's an example of white supremacy, when um, the white male is, is continually the standard. Um, and so you're comparing everyone to his pay. But in 2015, the study showed that Asian Americans were actually the highest paid. Um, so that's an interesting dynamic that we also see even in education when we think about um, academic achievement gaps. Um, 
the narrative is also is always about um, you know the the lagging performance of African Americans, and it doesn't talk about the uh, different opportunity gaps, um, the different resources that are presented at schools, and it really doesn't talk about how Asian Americans are actually outperforming anyone. Uh, so that's just another example of the way that um, culturally and institutionally, I think white supremacy just kind of continues to show up. And we, we can see that it's really not really based on anything but the norm, right? It's not based on the facts of what's happening. That's really interesting. So I kind of want to maybe tease out some of the um, systemic issues that contribute to the pay equity. So typically it's not going to be as overt as like, you know, this person is black, so we're going to pay them less, right? There's a lot of stuff going on um, under the under the iceberg, I guess, um, there. You mentioned being under-resourced, right? Um, education divides, I'm assuming, play into this. Uh, what else would you say plays into this? Well, in the work context, um, mm -hmm. I definitely believe it's just um, a matter of cultural norms. And, and that's why I think it's really important to have conversations like this um, so that it'll start to be on people's radar. Uh, when we talk about hiring practices, right? Um, there was a study years ago, um, and you know, I think partially I'll mention this so that people can actually go and look it up because I think that's a large part of the work that we will all have to do as we combat racism is really dig in and, and look things up for ourselves. But um, there was a study years ago done on resumes, right? And so they found that you could have the same resume um, exactly same set of experiences, same schools listed, uh, but they just changed the names. Um, and so when you had that same resume, but you put a name that was more ethnic sounding or African American sounding, um, they found that it was less likely to get an interview. Um, so that's just one example of the ways that systemically and in practice and in norms that we continue to kind of disadvantage some people. Um, and, it, and there's a number of things that go into that, right? Um, people may just have a certain familiarity. And so they tend to uh, go with things that are familiar, whether it be schools um, or you know geography. But we know that also race is often tied to a lot of those things. Me, for example, I went to an HBCU, Spelman College. Um, so, you know, some people have uh, negative views of HBCUs. Um, so it could be that, or it could just be that they're unfamiliar with it. So I might be less likely um, to get an interview from that hiring manager. Um, a way that we can combat this though, and um, I hope I'm not jumping too far ahead, but I do wanna just mention that there are different strategies in place. Um, and, and this deals with not just the hiring practice, but all levels of really training, um, setting up mentors and, and other aspects of ways that you can really incorporate um, and, and, and equalize opportunity. Um, you can, a lot of places, I think, they may struggle with this because you, you often have maybe one person, one HR manager, one person doing all of these interviews. So I've seen um, and I've recommended uh, that, that organizations have committees uh, that they also have. So they have a committee for interviews and for screening of resumes, but also that they uh, have a committee that's reviewing the questions that are asked. So that you see that, you know, sometimes when you're getting different questions, you're not really equalizing the playing field either. Um, and you also wanna have tiers of um, pay grades. And so often we see that, I think the most common, maybe well-known example is in a lot of government jobs, uh, those, those grades for, or the, the scale for pay is posted. And um, I think a lot of organizations could really benefit from making um, those decisions more transparent, 
Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's helpful for the people that are applying for work and hoping to have equal opportunity, but it's also a good reminder for those folks who are engaging in the process, who are actually giving offers uh, to make sure that we're doing it fairly um, and based on um, a set of parameters that's applied to everybody. That is wonderful. We will definitely recap that at the end. Um, I, I think that a lot, there's so many issues, right, that we could cover. Yeah. I think that transparency in wages is just like the, the dumbest, easiest thing that we could do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. That, well, I don't know why it's yeah. fine for everybody. Like, I'm not going to apply somewhere that's going to pay me, you know, this amount of money. So why am I going in and sending you a resume and then filling every stupid little blank out? Mm -hmm. And then I get there and I get in the interview and they're finally like, oh, we'll pay you a dollar an hour. And you're like, <laughs> Goodbye. Had <laughs> I known. Great. <laughs> oh, I would have like. spent all this time, you know, going through the process. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Um, so let's talk about maybe some of these other kind of aspects that pop up in the workplace specifically. Um, so I know that um, we talked a little bit about the concept of professionalism as being really rooted in like the white experience. Um, mm -hmm. To hear a little bit more about that. Sure. So um, I think one of the biggest examples of that is an area where I'm really excited that we've seen a lot of progress this year, actually, um, and over the last few years. And that just has to do with the norms of representation, right? And what is professional? So um, this, of course, extends beyond just the workplace. And, it, and actually some of the movement that we've seen um, has to do with professionalism, but it, it started because of a young man in New Jersey who um, was participating in a wrestling match and um, had to cut his locks on the mat during um, the, I don't know exactly what it's called, during the, the match. Um, during the match, you know, and he had to make this decision to cut his hair, which was pulled back. Um, he had done many, many matches with that hairstyle the way it was. And here he was at a very pivotal point. Um, and he had to, he, the, the, um, the person made him cut his locks, you know, and he did the, the family and uh, ended up suing. Um, I, sh I should have that name, but everyone feel free to do a quick Google search and you'll find it. Um, but this really sparked the conversation for um, when you're being, when, when your natural assets, your hair, your lips, whatever, um, are, are, are judged by the society that you live in and you can't participate like any other normal citizen. And I think that's really the issue. So, so when we think about the professional world also, when we think about what is professionalism, often hair has been an issue. There was a case that went um, either to the appeals or to the Supreme Court um, about hiring and whether or not a, an applicant could be required to cut their locks, which is a, a natural hairstyle. Um, the court upheld it, so the legislators and a lot of states um, have responded, which they have a right to do, um, by making hair discrimination illegal. And that is, you know, that's critical. People want to show up to work and not feel like they have to wear a mask, right? Or, you know, have standards that of, of, of professionalism that are not linked to your ethnic roots or, you know, um, I think to a certain extent, sometimes there are conversations about what's messy or, you know, that you do have to have a standard and that is understandable. Um, and the standard should be fair and apply everyone across the board. Uh, but we, we know that sometimes when you get into conversations about what's messy as in terms of hair, um, you know, I have, you know, a little a more calm hairstyle than sometimes I, I usually have. But when I have my natural hair out, it's quite big. And um, some may 
say that it's unprofessional, but uh, that's just because of the norms in our society, right? Um, I'm fully capable of doing my job. Um, I'm fully capable of doing my job very well, uh, despite my hair. Uh, so um, I did, I did want to name that the Crown Act is something that's been going around in Maryland recently um, approved a version of it that bans hair discrimination. Um, that's a bill that uh, started in California. Um, and there's just something that's very exciting. It says that, you know, I think it's a, it definitely um, gives black people um, the confidence and um, lets them know, hey, it's okay to be you in the workplace. Um, we see you, we value you and um, you're not going to be discriminated on based on race. And, you know, this is exciting. We should be here. You know, it's pretty remarkable that in 2020, we are just now seeing some of these things. And, you know, it is very unfortunate that, you know, 30 years after um, the Civil Rights Act, um, maybe almost 40, we're still having to make some of these things law. Um, but progress is good. And even conversations like this are more than welcomed. And, you know, we're, we all as a society, black and white and other, you know, must keep pushing. Yeah, I, it's just so baffling to me that people are upset about hair and like, in all the scheme of things. And, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about the other like hiring discrimination and it's like, sex and religion and then, you know, race. And then now we're in hair. Like, I feel like gone totally off the rails because people aren't trusted to <laughs> be nice human beings, I guess. Um, and I, I, I don't know. And I, I've thought about that a lot, having worked with, um, I'm in a human service field. Mm -hmm. I had a ton of uh, Black coworkers and a ton of um, as well. And I would say it's probably about a 50-50 split, which was interesting because that's not what we see out in the population. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see this split, but I noticed that a lot of our, my black peers were not wearing their natural like hair out, or even um, if they did braids, they were very short, like they had very short hairstyles, which I thought was interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Having gone to school with a ton of people that had, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, different style. varying styles, I should mm -hmm. say. Um, so it was kind of interesting. And I'm reflecting back on this now. And I was like, huh, like everybody had like the same three or four kind of hairstyles and it mm -hmm. must have sort of conformity to norms or whether unintentional, right? Some of that might just be, I like this haircut or hairstyle. Now. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, and I think it is a combination. And it's, a, it's also a very personal decision and it should be. And people, um, I think one thing about the way that this plays out is, you know, under the radar, you know, African-Americans are having to make these decisions. Um, if I wear my hair like this to an interview, will I get the job? You know, um, if I show up, me personally, um, I worked as a professional lobbyist um, in Annapolis, which is, um, it's a very um, homogenous environment, right? And for a long time, I did um, just wear my hair straight. Um, it's a style that I still like but I also like to switch it up. But I, had, I hadn't really worn my hair out natural and, and more like Afro style or twist or, you know, larger style. Um, and then so I had to really contemplate and actually talk myself into doing that. And the, fir the first few times um, it was, I was self-conscious. And, you know, that's not because anybody said you can never do that or that's unprofessional, but it's definitely in the messages that we get. Um, and it happens when you have a, an environment where there's just not as much diversity. And that's why representation is so important. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I started my company, uh, Community Intelligence LLC. It's a consulting firm for public relations and organizational leadership. Um, and I found that when you have communities really invested and involved in the transformation process, uh, you get such 
better, wide ranging results that are really inclusive. And I think that ultimately to really have the changes that we seek, we need to make inclusivity a regular practice, right? It should be second nature. And when we have any instances where we don't see a lot of diversity, um, we have to question that immediately, right? Um, you may have someone coming to speak who feels pressure, um, who's feeling um, maybe doubt and just not sure they will be received based on the information that they're giving just because of their hair, for example. And so, um, yeah, that's just, it's just really, it's just a norm, unfortunately. I, I'm glad that we can have these conversations to make people more, of, more aware that the, this is the impact, you know, of, of racism, of a society like this. Um, it's not just getting pulled over, it's everyday considerations. Um, and I know that often I do wanna address that sometimes people may say, well, you know, it's not fair, you know, the society that we live in isn't fair. Um, and people often have to think about a number of things, right? Uh, but those considerations really shouldn't fall along the lines of race, you know, I shouldn't have to worry um, because of something that is so tied to my ethnicity. Uh, because, you know, that's unconstitutional. And we've decided that that's not the norm that we want to have in our society. Uh, we decided this a long time ago. And it's important that we make that the experience of every American and every, you know, every person that's here in this country. Yeah. Um, really quickly, because I love that you called out people for Googling and stuff. That's a huge <laughs> too. I'm always like, go check out this video. Go look at this. Same thing. Um, I encourage you all to Google professional hairstyles and look at the images. Um, I was recently made aware of this, not something I thought about before, right? <laughs> white privilege right here. So if you look, it's just a whole bunch of, you know, white women's hairstyles, basically. I think you have to scroll all the way to the bottom or even get onto page two to find um, black hairstyles um, in there as well. Um, and I, I did not look at the men, I will be honest. <laughs> All right, but you can do it yourself as a thought experiment. Um, but it's just, it's really eye opening to, to see that. Um, and again, it was just a, a white privilege check there. I was like, huh, I never, never thought about Googling professional hairstyles, um, first off. And then, you know, second to, to look at what was represented was really interesting. Um, so we've mentioned representation a couple of times. So I want to, I want to hop into this topic a little bit. Um, so what do you mean by representation? We'll start there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so when I talk about representation, I'm talking about one aspect is definitely diversity and having um, just a range of voices. And I think it's important to recognize that, you know, there's been an important evolution, I believe, in our conversations about diversity. Um, I usually like to say diversity and inclusion. And I'll give you an example. Uh, so, you know, there, there could be someone who's invited to a dance, right? And it's one thing to be invited um, and then not really you know, not really acknowledged, which is the case sometimes, that's not gonna be a great experience. Um, but it's another thing to be invited and asked to dance, right? And that puts you in a totally different category of, of feeling a part of that thing. Now, the, the level that we want everyone to be on, right? I think is to be invited to the party or the dance and be able to dance and be carefree and and just have it a, a great time and feel that feel that boldness that comfort uh, to know that you can do that freely and so when I think about representation um, I, I like to use that example um, in terms of what it means to have a diverse representation to have actual not just um, you know, symbolic representation, to not just have just one, but to really have people uh, in a space feel included 
um, to value their, their thoughts, um, to make sure that it truly is an arena that is comfortable and for everyone, you know, where everyone is in the space, carefree, jamming out, having a great time. Um, another layer to that too is, it, I think it's kind of helpful to people to just think about is if you invite people somewhere, um, let's say you're, you're, you have um, most participants that listen to rock music and you have one that listens to gospel, right? And so you're, you're there, everybody is invited to the space, but the whole night you only play rock music. Is that enjoyable? I don't think so, right? Um, and sometimes people know what they're getting into, but if you're invited somewhere, you would expect there to be a range of music. Or let's say you just have one gospel song or, and then, um, you know, it's back to, back to rock music. And so I, I also like to give that example too, because, you know, people that enjoy rock aren't going to notice that, right? But it definitely has a real impact on the way that person who just doesn't listen to rock as much um, enjoys their time, even though they were welcome to the party, um, they were invited and they, they were in the room. That is an excellent way to describe that. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I have heard- I have to give a shout out to a, a, a colleague of mine oh, who gave okay. me that example. And I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> trying to pass it along. Yeah, no, that was really beautiful. I appreciate that because I think a lot of people struggle with, you know, like, well, you're here, so <laughs> you do something about it, right? Instead of accepting that as part of the responsibility of leadership and boards and all that kind of stuff to make sure that we're not just like, well, what do you think? And we turn around to the one individual that we have somehow managed to convince to be on the board to represent, you know, <laughs> the population, which is upsetting. And I've seen it many times. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think I'll just add to that in that aspect. Um, just when we think about workforce in general, right? Um, you may have a few, and I think maybe law firms, I hate to pick on them, but they're a good example. Um, and, and let's talk about leadership, right? Um, you might have, I think it's 1% of partners across the country um, and we're talking thousands and thousands of thousands of partners so one percent um, are are of color um, and the number is is barely it's either right under one percent or right under two percent for that number that is is women of color or black women to be specific. So, you know, representation is important because in that field, for example, the pipeline is really crucial, you know, establishing part relationships or partnerships um, with a higher up mentor, you know, that person gives you assignments, that person checks in, that person may invite you, you know, to the golf course or, you know, all of the different places where decision make, just decision making is happening and relationships are being developed outside. And if you have so little representation, it's not impossible, but the chances of really growing um, the circle or the net and, and having it be reflective of our society that we live in, um, those chances are lower substantially. Um, so, you know, I just raised that example because when I decided to go to law school, um, you know, there were about 3% attorneys of color and that was back in early 2000s. And unfortunately that number really hasn't changed in the last uh, two decades. So that, that's just one area where, um, you know, it's a specialized area, but it is one that even though um, opportunity has expanded, um, the numbers and the growth, especially in leadership, have, have been um, just uh, terribly low in terms of diversity and representation. Yeah, and I think we have to use examples to call out the issues. I 
we can't speak broadly, although, you know, we can use the examples to highlight the broader issues. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I, you know, I would love to, <laughs> to like pick apart every single industry, but <laughs> we don't have the time. Right. The, and again, we welcome people to do those those Google searches. Um, there's so much of this information that's readily available. It is, and I and I love that right now we're in a time where people are interested. Um, and unfortunately, at home or you know, I, hopefully, too many people haven't lost their jobs. But you know, people have that extra um, time that they're not commuting um, to you know instead of maybe watching so much of the news feed, really um, kind of dig in and, and see what the, what the data has shown uh, for so many of these issues that are kind of top of the mind right now. Yeah, um, so I know that you and I talked a little bit about um, management, so not necessarily like board leadership or see the C-suite leadership, but looking at you know, the middle management or even upper middle management and um, kind of what what the systemic norms and all of that does to not only representation but then the people that are represented what happens to them there so i don't know if you want to <laughs> sure i am um, i think me i think i was referring to maybe um something that i've seen is how systems of support change or are impacted based on leadership uh, so in industries that I've worked in and nonprofits, for example, um, you, it's pretty uh, glaring, in my opinion, that although it's a service industry that is dedicated to opportunity and definitely um, committed to marginalized communities, oftentimes when you look at the staffing in those areas, um, in nonprofits especially, you might see that there's not a lot of diversity, right? And then if there is, unfortunately, you might see people of color at the very entry or lower level jobs only. And, um, and I think that's a major problem, especially in a field like that, um, where the commitment is supposed to be to opportunity and expanding opportunity. And if that's your true commitment, I definitely believe that that should start at home, right? As you know, I think Americans say that about a lot of things, um, checking your own backyard, right? Um, so as we're having these conversations, as we're seeing so much transformation um, and people wanna help, people wanna donate, and people want to uh, give their money and time to causes that are really committed to, and have been for a long time, committed to social justice and racial justice. Um, I challenge them to look into the makeup of these companies, you know, um, and it's not to say that we don't ever give to them, um, but I do encourage them to seek out Black-led, companies. Um, a lot of them are smaller. They need support and they do the work in a different way. And you can also support those other organizations, but please ask questions and challenge them on those practices. Like I said, I, I am really passionate about the workforce um, because that is our everyday, right? Um, unfortunately, we know that people spend more time with their work colleagues than their families. Um, that, that's changing. It's a, it's a good and bad thing because we have this little thing called a pandemic. Um, so people are actually seeing their families a little more but you know in our normal scheme of things we are spending a lot of time at work and that extends into our mental health right so we should not be in a situation where we have you know a large group of people um, based on race many times that are just subject to to a totally different standard of living and working um, due to racial trauma and uh, maybe not getting the supports that they need, uh, maybe not being provided the opportunity. And that, and oftentimes I, I just do wanna make clear that it's, it's because of a system and the structures that are in place. So it's not, even, it's not even always that we're saying, we don't wanna help these black people or we don't wanna see them succeed. 
Uh, but when you open doors, um, you do have to make sure that the pipeline is there, that the supports are there, and that they are treated like any other worker. And, and I think we have a lot of work to do in that department. Yeah, um, I, I think we've unpacked a little bit of that, <laughs> the work that we need to do. Um, I thank you for bringing up the mental health piece. I want to make sure that we tie this in really strongly. Um, so what do you think somebody would feel like if they were told their hair is not acceptable? What do you think that poor young man threw on the wrestling mat, right? Mm -hmm. These are really, really important considerations when we ask people to not show up as, as we okay. or to not be their authentic selves. Um, yeah, and, and that's another, just another kind of, maybe fascinating, maybe sad aspect um, to the time that we're in right now. I think it's becoming more apparent to more people just how um, normal this, this really abnormal, <laughs> what, and I'll just, maybe I'll just say what an abnormal existence a lot of people of color are living in this society where uh, you have to mask who you are in order to maybe make a living in order to what we've seen recently, um, you know, walk down the street, um, trying not to be a threat to other people, um, you know, go into a store, you know, you can't play your music a certain way, just a lot of the normal things in society where someone may live differently and show up differently, you know, that is, that's traumatic, right? Um, there's no other way to say it. I think uh, oftentimes and for many years, centuries even, um, we've been made to think that a lot of those facts about our society are normal. And so I love the conversation that's happening and I love the corporate leadership that we're seeing. And I hope that it translates into, you know, policy changes within. Um, but, you know, just the recognition that Black Americans are living a different existence and it shouldn't be. And we thought we move, move past this and, um, you know, it's not like we have the segregated, um, you know, signs, you know, for colored only or anything like that right now. But unfortunately, we're, our society is still segregated in many ways. Um, you know, in, in Baltimore, for example, we just saw an incident that happened at a restaurant where there was a dress code and it was enforced. Uh, and these are children that, that were the, the, the issue here. Um, but there was, you know, there was a dress code that was enforced for um, a black little boy and not for the, for the, for the white family. And so, um, you know, that, that I think a conversation like this is critical. That's why I actually um, wanted to volunteer my time to just have this conversation and, you know, talk about how it impacts me because, you know, I have been in a situation where I have felt like I was under undue stress, um, inappropriate stress. Um, and I decided that that was not normal. That was not something I was willing to put up with and that I had to, I had to change my environment because of it. And, um, you know, unfortunately that's, that's not fair. Um, and that's not something that a lot of people should have to do. Um, but these are decisions that are made a lot of times and they certainly can impact, um, your mental health. Um, and I would also encourage people to be thinking about that, um, both those who have experienced something traumatic um, related to race and those who are in an environment where, you know, they may see something and um, maybe look the other way. You know, it's easy in our society to say, that's not my business or I can't do anything about it. But, um, you know, you would be amazed at what just a simple acknowledgement, a look, um, a question, a polite question um, might change, you know, the impact that that might have. Um, and I think that those are all the steps that, you know, we can all individually take. And it's even more important for those of us that are in leadership um, as we really work to change systems. 
Wow, so much good stuff there. Uh, so thank you for bringing up the restaurant because I didn't even connect that with our conversation that we were planning on having today. Um, I did see, not that this really excuses anything, that they hired the two managers and they're redoing or throwing out the dress code. That's too little too late, but it's good. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I don't even know what to say. You know, there'd be varying <laughs> opinions about whether or not it's enough action or, you know, mm -hmm. too much um you know so somebody's livelihood uh, impacted but yeah. you know this impacts black people's livelihoods every day like racism is not a small thing and so when people see the repercussions and they have sympathy or they um you know they immediately say oh that's not fair like it's not fair for people to be subject to that um, um to these indignities right, in their daily life. Um, some, you know, we should just take as much seriousness um, when we are dealing with a response to a bad behavior. You know, we should think about that bad behavior just as seriously because it does have um, long standing impacts in most cases. Yeah. Um, so we, we only have a couple more minutes left. So I wanna make sure that you do have the like, recommendations piece and I know we've been spilling it throughout so <laughs> um, so you mentioned having mentors um, you mentioned having mentors uh, available for people of color is that what you were intending there yeah yeah so um, yeah just to circle back um, like we, we started the conversation with the idea of pay equity um, people of color in the workplace and there are a number of um, a number of tools I would say that are very useful. Um, I think it's important to not only just have a chief diversity officer, um, but to really establish what your mission and your goals are with regards to representation, diversity, and inclusion in your work setting. Um, that has to be done and has to be incorporated into every part of your organization um, because it, it is an issue that will come up in every aspect of the organization. It's just inevitable, right? So um, oftentimes we may see companies, they just have that one person and it's really difficult to change norms. You know, these are, these are so intrinsic. Um, they're, they're decades in the making. And so we shouldn't leave that on one person. So I definitely recommend a review of policies um, and an actual committee when you wanna make changes in that arena. Um, that's where I would start. Okay, so committees are great and also not great sometimes. <laughs> yeah. um, but you, you have multiple people to share the load, which is important mm -hmm. to come down to one person making huge decisions on race, ethnicity, et cetera, especially because we don't have one ethnicity right. in the department. Yeah. So it should be a fair representation, as we've been saying, of, you know, hopefully the general population, but certainly mm -hmm. the population of the workplace. Um, yes. And I will say that, um, you know, committees, you, you can have your, you can have levels of success, but at least a lot of times you can at least have um, buy-in from others. Um, I think the actual CEO or manager um, really making decisions about policies would be more likely to listen. And hopefully if they have made the move to, um, or, or you know, are moving in the direction to address some of these issues that we see, uh, hopefully they will actually uh, be respectful of those, those committee members and try to be responsive. Um, we know that it's it's hard and we've seen that fail, I think in some cases, but um, I am one who believes you just have to keep keep trying uh, till you get it right, so. Yeah, um, that's great and inspirational. I'll rethink my <laughs> videos. <laughs> I'm a member of a couple that um, had lower levels of success as we gently said. <laughs> And um, I also really liked your idea about um, using the committee for like interviewing and screening. And I think it's funny because um, one of the driest interviews I've ever had in my entire life was for a government position. And I was like, 
there's like six people in this room. They're all staring at me. They have exactly 10 questions and nothing else. And I was like, this is the weirdest interview that I've ever been in. And like, there's no human connection. Like I, nobody smiled at me. And that might've just been indicative of that government. <laughs> yeah. Interviewed for. But I was like, wow, government, I don't know about this um, style, but I thought about how it was probably meant to even the, the playing field that there wasn't any sort of preference, but it was a very strange experience on my end. Um, that sounds strange. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure part of that is uh, just, you know, people not paying attention, right? Um, <laughs> you know. That's okay. I won't take offense. I didn't really want the job anyway, <laughs> but, you know, I was like, oh, the government, you know. And, I will say this. I think it's important no matter what industry or what field to bring uh, your humanity, right? And ultimately, when we talk about uh, conversations about diversity and inclusion, that's essentially what we want. We're not robots. And so I've, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I actually have been on committees and I do think it's important to make people feel comfortable. So yeah, that sounds like a horrible experience and I would not want any committee that I'm a part of to engage like that. But you know, people are busy, you know, they, they take their oh. time to engage and it goes, you know. No, it's, it's a mix. A strange experience. <laughs> Not all of the government interviews are like this, or even at this branch. Um, <laughs> right. But I, I mean, that's a good to... point, though, because it does just want to say it's it's culture is so important and it shows up in, in many different ways. Right. And so who knows what was going on in that team? You know, what kind of personal issue one may, you know, somebody may have just been cursed out the, the time before, you know, so they were a little on edge. Um, but I also like to remind people that a lot of times those types of issues really don't have anything to do with them personally. Um, it's really definitely a, a reflection of the culture. And I left that interview going, mm, I don't... <laughs> I don't see myself fitting in here just because I'm like, I'm loud and <laughs> Fun. I laugh and stuff. And I was like, nobody even smiled. I don't think I can work somewhere where people don't smile. So <laughs> it's just funny. I don't want to derail us too far here. <laughs> Committees, being really mindful of the um, interviewing process. I've seen some interesting um, theories put forth based off of that um, study you mentioned before saying that we should just remove names um, from resumes and just let you know resume stand for itself of course it's tricky when you get to the like mm -hmm. you know, to know somebody's name at some point um yeah. part yeah that was interesting um interesting i can't say that i've heard about that one but it is interesting yeah so they the idea is that they would put like candidate a or candidate 100 yeah whatever and then you'd look at it from the computer because you sat there and typed mm -hmm. up <laughs> boxes in and then you get it up and you're like oh candidate 113 you know excellent so we're moving them on to the next stage and then they're flagged as somebody to call for an interview and so there's less of the um bias available um based on names whether right. familiarity or yeah issues or whatever is going on there right had so many good bystander tips that i would love to um kind of rehash them if you don't mind so giving somebody a look could be really helpful. And I wasn't sure if you meant <laughs> to the perpetrator or to the yeah. experiencing the issue or both. Yeah. And so I will just kind of um, give a disclaimer that I am not like a professional in this, right? Um, I mean, I'm a professional in diversity and equity, but not necessarily in intervention and sometimes these are very tricky situations right mm -hmm. so i'll just say people should definitely use their best judgment but there there is evidence and there is a such thing as like bystander training and intervention when you're dealing with race um, so that's definitely something people should look up um, and do more research on because i will say though um whether it's in a meeting, um, we talked a little bit about representation and how it shows up and we didn't really talk about the daily interactions in the workplace. Um, you know, sometimes people may make inappropriate jokes. Um, sometimes it may be about race or any other inappropriate thing. And oftentimes people just kind of laugh it off, um, even when they know it's wrong or when it may rub someone the wrong way. 
Um, and that's an opportunity where people can say, hey, or, you know, they can, they can tailor it to their own personality. But I think the important thing is that you say something or give the person a look or a nod or tell them to come back to your office. There's so many ways that we can um, just show up for each other. Um, because, and I think this is kind of just a general kind of reminder about the workplace and culture and even mental health. You know, we know that isolation is very unhealthy and damaging, right? So when we give someone the look and when we show that something was inappropriate or that we see you, we acknowledge you, your feedback, um, that really makes a difference in inclusion. Um, so that's just, you know, one point. I did want to mention, and I'm not sure this, if, you know, I know we're kind of short on time, but I think um, another way that we can uh, be very intentional about how we are engaging, even right now, and I want to say, I'm going to be very respectful, um, but when we have uh, conversations about race, I think a lot of times um, we are not being as considerate, and this is the, maybe, I don't know if that's too strong of a word, but this is generally um, whether you, I know that people were reaching out to their friends of color, people were doing a lot of things to try to understand. Um, but that it's an emotional toll, right? Um, and so there are a number of ways that we are including people of color, um, but we also need to really be aware of that additional kind of uh, tax um, on people of color as they talk about some of these things. Uh, I know that for me, I am pretty, you know, I was a sociology major. <laughs> so, you know, I love talking about this stuff. I could go on for hours. I know we don't have that much time. Um, but, you know, people should be, you know, compensated in certain instances um, where we think it's appropriate or where it's situations where we might um, compensate other experts, you know, because this is a time where we're we're living out something that um, not everyone can talk about. And so people of color have a certain expertise. Um, and when we think about how we treat um, black professionals, often we don't treat them the same. And that, you know, that's just, uh, that's just kind of unfortunately the fact. So there are times where we could be maybe more um, creative about how we are inviting uh, people of color to a space um, to talk about something that can be very uh, traumatic and very personal. Um, so that's just, that's just one side note I did want to throw out there because I, there's a lot of conversation about that to be frank. And um, I am a person that believes in transparency. And I do want, you know, I want people to be aware of just the, some of the dynamics, um, a lot of the dynamics that we are not always privy to. Um, sometimes we don't feel comfortable, people of color may not feel comfortable talking about it. Um, but I do think it's very important to the conversation, especially at a time like now. Thank you. Um, I Emotional labor is something we've talked about on the podcast before. Um, we talked about, uh, we will be talking about in this Black Mental Health Matters um, series, we're talking about racial battle fatigue, we're talking about the history of racial trauma. Mm -hmm. So we do have, a, if you're listening now, I hope that you listen to the full series of this um, and that you make any recommendations if you think there's other topics we should explore. I'm totally open to finding the right person to come talk to us um, about this. Uh, so I really appreciate, again, your time, uh, Kimberly been really lovely to chat with you about all of the different things. We went way into hair, which I was not expecting, but it was really fun to talk about um, and just examine how something that seems really simple, like I brush my hair every day and I just go on with my life. It's just something that I really don't think about um, as much. And so I think it's just a, a weird way that um, we can look at the systemic issues that kind of evolve. Yeah. So I always end my episodes with a self-care send-off. Do you have a self-care tip that you would like to share with our listeners? Ooh, so many. Like I said, um, 
I would share probably a pretty basic one, but I think it's so critical. And that is meditation. Um, it's very important that people take the time. Uh, out, our, our days can be pretty hectic and it's a little, it's a little different right now while well, most of us are at home, but we are getting ready to ease back into the normal way of being, I suppose. We'll see what those, those numbers continue to look like as far as um, hospital stays and COVID testing. Um, but I would say people should, um, people, all backgrounds, no matter, um, no matter your job, even if you're a stay-at-home mom, uh, find that time to uh, just collect your thoughts, you know, not think about your to-do list and uh, really kind of set the stage for how you want your day to be. And I guarantee that you will be so appreciative of yourself for making that time for yourself. Thank you. That's a great tip. Um, if you have literally never done meditation before, I always recommend Headspace as a free app to just get started. And you can say, I have two minutes a day. And I promise you have two minutes a day. I promise. Then there's exactly. A <laughs> two minutes is enough. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. We take time. I've heard people describe it as we take time and uh, to care for so many things, but never just for our mental health space. It's like pretty wow. crazy. We go through all of our lives. Like, I didn't start till you know, I'm over 30 years of. Um, I'm not gonna say my age, of course, but you <laughs> know, over 30 <laughs> years of not taking that time, and it has changed my life. Hmm. Yeah, I I think that uh, schools don't often teach, um, and parents weren't taught, um, and so <laughs> you make. Yeah mid-20s and something I do like about the internet for all of the, I mean, many things about the internet, but what I especially like about the internet is it opens up this um, vulnerability that people can share um, each other. To be clear, Kimberly and I do not know each other. This is the first time <laughs> we met. Um, and so this is just, it's just a fascinating tool to be able to learn, to diversify what you are learning from. You don't get stuck only looking at one news channel. Um, you don't read books by one type of author, et cetera. You, you're always working to broaden your view. Um, and so that's that's going to be my self-care tip, I think, for today, is to continue to broaden your view and learn from people that are, are different from you in all aspects um, and, and see what you learn um, in that way. So um, I think that concludes our episode for today. Thank you again, Kimberly, so much for you know coming and talking to us. Um, it's been a delight. We are wishing you good mental health. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day.